Kim Possible has got to be one of the most beloved Disney Channel cartoons of the early 2000s. With four seasons, two animated movies, and a crossover special, it's no secret that the show snuck its way into the hearts of viewers around the world. And today, we're going to cover the series from beginning to end. Here we go. Kim Possible. Call me Big Man. If you want to reach me, when you want to face me, it's so cool. Whenever you need. To start off, let's get the basics out of the way. The show stars Kim, a high school student who just so happens to also be a crime fighter in her spare time. However, she can't fight the forces of evil on her own, and so has her good friend Ron Stoppable as her sidekick. Ron has a little sidekick of his own too, that being Rufus, the naked mole rat. As well as that, Kim has her guy in the chair in Wade a genius 10-year-old who's in charge of all tech-related issues for Kim. Whether she needs an invention, intel, or someone to hack a bad guy's machine, Wade's the man for the job. But every hero has gotta have villains, and Kim's got two major arch enemies, the mad scientist Dr. Draken and his partner in crime, Shigo, a girl with the power to harness and weaponize energy. But Kim's life isn't all about being a hero. She's still a high school student, and has to constantly juggle both sides of her life, which, believe me, you'll see is no easy task. But that's just the gist of the show out of the way. So now, let's start our recap with the first episode, titled Crush. Can you guess what this one's about? Our first episode gives us a great rundown of the basics of the show, and also just a fun episode to boot. We see Kim fawning over her crush, Josh Mankey, before getting called by Wade about an emergency situation in Tokyo that's been submitted to her website. Turns out Dr. Dragon is involved and is taking over a factory, so there's no time to waste. The team reaches the factory and Kim hands Dan the Kim Municator, assigning him the role of the distraction. What's up? Naked Mole Rat TV is on the air! Things seem alright at first, with Kim saving some workers who've been taken hostage, but it quickly collapses when Ron is caught, leaving time for an easy escape for Shigo and Dr. Draken, who also steal the factory's machines. Interesting. The next morning, Kim's father reads the newspaper and hears of Kim's heroism and tells her, nice work, despite Kim not being entirely satisfied. However, this scene also lets us know two things. One, Kim has very supportive parents. That's awesome. Two, Kim doesn't have a secret identity or anything like that, which, if you know anything about superheroes, means things can get real messy real quick. Anywho, the rest of Kim's family comes in as well, with Kim's mom giving her advice on how to ask Josh, her crush, remember, to a school dance. Kim's brothers, Jim and Tim, are little troublemakers, just in case you were wondering. At school, Kim does try to ask Josh out, but her high school rival, Bonnie Rockwaller, destroys her confidence, and so she decides to ask him after cheerleading practice, which she messes up during, even tearing a banner Josh was working on. She's called back to action after Wade finds Dr. Draken's secret lair. Rufus accidentally trips the security system. and are taken back to the lair where they discover Draken used the factory machines to make a giant robot. The ultimate robot warrior! His goal is to take over the world, of course. Just as Kim is about to be blasted to bits, Wade hacks the robot and saves the day. All seems well until Shigo blasts in and fights Kim. Thankfully, the robot, malfunctioning at this point, knocks the villains into submission, and the world is saved. Oh, and Kim asks Josh out, and he says yes. I need a ride too. Uh, you could swing by around 7.15. So, yeah, pretty solid day for Kim, I'd say. In the episode, The New Ron, Ron gets a haircut that he eventually comes around to. He's not a big fan at first, to say the least. When Ron gets a cowlick, though, he wants to head back to Kim's stylist friend over in France to buy some hair gel. And so, they do just that. A tad drastic, but, you know, I can kinda resonate. The stylist recommends Ron get a new style alongside the hair gel, too. But just as they head out to get new threads, all of Europe goes through a blackout. They find some sort of island with the lights still on and meet the inhabitants. Senior Senior, Senior and his son, Senior Senior Junior, who seem to be very, very rich. Your haircut, it is very nice. I use Lagoop. As do I. 
But your clothes, they do not harmonize. I know. I'm all over it, dude. And don't realize their massive house is draining the power grid. Ron starts saying their home reminds him a lot of villain layers, and inadvertently convinces the billionaire to become a supervillain. Meanwhile, a few days later, Ron's hair and new style has gone straight to his head, and he's acting like an entirely different, extra snobby person. He even ditches Rufus. How dare he? Wade contacts Kim and says the power has gone out in Europe again thanks to Senior Senior. Senior and I'll just call him Junior because that name is so long. But this time, it's on purpose. While fighting, Ron and Junior both get distracted by their hair over the missiles that are about to launch, and eventually Ron realizes how stupid he's being. Thank goodness. He ditches the comb he was fighting for and instead just focuses on the missiles that he should have been focusing on the whole time, learning once and for all that when it comes to choosing between vanity and saving the world, you really shouldn't have that much of a debate. The senior duo escape. But Ron returns home and realizes that with his old hair back, that things are gonna return to normal. But that's okay. Also, wow, this girl is a jerk to Ron. It's me, it's, it's Ron. What's so I, so I ditched the do, it's what's inside that matters, right? Right? Like, who told you that, loser? In the episode titled Number One, Kim is forced to team up with another agent, Will Do, in order to save a kidnapped weapons expert. The guy who kidnapped the expert is a Scottish stereotype looking fella named Duff Killigan, who has a big thing for golf. I mean, I guess we all have our hobbies. To make a 23 minute long story short, Kim, Will, and Ron put an end to his evil weapons plans, and for some reason, it's thanks to dandelions. Don't question it. Ooh, ooh. Oh, no. The next episode in the timeline is Attack of the Killer BBs, and it's got a lot of interesting details. Ron decides to join the cheerleading team for an extracurricular activity. Kim's dad is shown to be a rocket scientist, and these robot things attack a scientist. Ron decides that instead of being a cheerleader, he wants to be a mascot. But the cheerleading squad feels that all he'll do is embarrass the school. Kim talks it over with her dad, and he reveals that he had a group of scientist friends back in the day, complete with their own little embarrassing friend. On the night of a dance, it was Drew's job to get the rest of the scientists dates, and he showed up with a bunch of robotic girls all named BB. They malfunctioned, leading to the gang to laugh at Drew until he dropped out of college altogether. To this day, Mr. Possible feels bad about ruining Drew's dream and wants to make sure Ron doesn't fall down the same path. But Kim feels Ron's idea is just too dumb. Kim gets an alert from Professor Ramish, one of her dad's friends, saying that he needs help. She arrives to see that robot girls, coincidentally named BB, are kidnapping him. And of course, Ron accidentally lets them get away because of course he does. Ron later figures out Kim's dad is the next target for the BBs and decides to disguise himself as Mr. Possible, without Kim's knowledge of course, as he's mad that she doesn't like his mascot idea. He gets abducted and brought right back to Dr. Draken's lab who seems to have been behind the whole thing. Kim and her dad show up to burst the captives out, but Dr. Possible recognizes Dr. Draken as his old friend from his story, Drew. Draken wanted to prove his BB concept could work to his old friends, but unfortunately, just as he was doing so, the BBs turned on Draken. He really isn't that great of a mad scientist, is he? Thanks to a little bit of science help from her dad, Kim takes out the robots and frees the scientists, and takes down Draken for the heck of it too. Oh, and to cap everything off, Ron and Kim make up, and Ron gets to do his mascot routine, which the school apparently actually likes? High school is weird. They like him? Yeah, kind of surprises me too. <laughs> a few episodes later, while Kim is on a mission to help an explorer find an artifact to put in a museum, we found out that Ron has a hardcore fear of monkeys. See, apparently when he was younger, Ron had to go to summer camp called Camp Wanna Weep where he bunked with the camp mascot, who just so happened to be an out of control monkey. See, I can't really blame Ron though, monkeys really can be scary. Anyways, the explorer named Lord Monty Fisk is looking for a jade monkey statue and briefly brings up that some of the locals of the forest they're searching believe if placed alongside other statues that it'll create some weird monkey power, but he dismisses it as nonsense. Kim finds the monkey and all seems to be going well, that is until a ninja shows up to the team's camp at night and steals the monkey, leading to Kim heading home a bit disappointed. Meanwhile, 
Lord Monty Fisk is shown to have monkey-like attributes, and it's revealed that he secretly disguised himself as that ninja to throw Kim off his trail from his real plan. Now that she got the last jade monkey he needed, he can start the process of gaining his monkey powers. Kim and Ron go back to the Lord Fisk to see if there's been an update on finding the statue, but Fisk thinks they've caught on to his plan and decides to whip out the classic evil monologue on them to their utter surprise. He shows Kim and Ron the surgically implanted monkey hands and feet he's received, and then begins the ritual to gain his powers, and becomes the villain Monkey Fist. Sounds a lot like Monty Fisk, huh? Ron stops Monkey Fist and breaks his jade statues, making him lose his power, leading to yet another day being saved. and even a fear being partially overcome, so that's pretty neat, I'd say. I mean, monkeys are still really scary, though. The next episode introduces a new villain for Dr. Draken. Professor Dementor, Draken's rival, steals a pan-dimensional vortex inducer that he himself was going after. If that wasn't bad enough, Dementor's henchmen completely outclass Draken's. sending his confidence into a downward spiral. Shigo decides to go steal some henchman gadgets from Jack Hench, who runs a henchman factory, and Kim is alerted of it by Wade, having them sent to Henchco headquarters. This show is something else, but I love it. Kim gets a bad vibe from the place and investigates, beats up some henchmen, and then is introduced properly to Jack Hench, who requires Kim's help. He shows her a ring that makes henchmen buff. <laughs> and says Shigo stole a whole batch of the rings. Ron takes the last one for himself and, of course, puts it on. Meanwhile, Draken and his now buff henchmen plan on stealing the pan-dimensional vortex from Professor Dementor in Las Vegas and arrive at a hotel where the guy is just in a pool, chilling. Kim arrives on the scene and sneaks in alongside Draken, who also had to sneak in due to not being a hotel patron. Dementor saw him coming, though, and soaked Draken for his troubles. Everyone ends up fighting in the hotel lobby to get their hands on the vortex inducer, but eventually, Draken ends up activating it by accident. Did I mention that vortex will be the size of the state of Nevada? Oh, we're in Nevada! <laughs> How ironic! And everyone has to try and fetch it before it destroys all of Nevada. Ron tries to get it, but gets stuck and realizes he has to lose his muscles to save the day, which he reluctantly does. Also, Buff Rufus is now a thing that exists. This next episode may be one of the weirdest season finales I've ever seen for any show. In Low Budget, a spat with an alligator has Kim accidentally ruin her favorite pair of jeans. Sorry, Kim. The pants are DOA. They were brand new clump and Nana! Ron and Kim go to Smarty Mart to pick up cheap pants, but Kim isn't a fan, preferring more high fashion clothes. That'll be $5.99. Ten times less than you'd pay for the same pants at Club Banana. So not the same. You're such a retail snob. The pair head off to the mall to get pants from Club Banana, great name, and run into Bonnie Rockwaller, who of course rags on Kim's, well, rags. Out of the blue, a clerk from Smarty Mart named Frugal Luker reveals his evil plan to destroy the internet unless everyone in the world sends him a dollar. To make matters worse, it seems Wade can't even contact Kim due to this guy's technological terror. And to make matters even more worse, Kim can't buy a new pair of pants because the registers are down. Well, now they've got to do something. Oh, also, Smarty Mart and Club Banana are run by the same company, so that's cool. The gang then realizes finding the Smarty Mart guy isn't going to be easy with so many Smarty Marts around the country, and so they get to work, first removing what seems to be a fake beard and mustache to see what this frugal lucre really looks like. Kim tries to access the Smarty Mart databases to see where this weirdo works, but is caught. Thankfully, she writes it off as trying to get a job and gets the info she needs. She finds he works for a store in Philadelphia and heads over to his mom's house where he lives in the basement. Of course he does. Proclaiming himself a bargain bin villain, Frugal Luker catches Kim and Ron. Ma! I'm with my friends! Sorry, Francis. Could I get anyone some chips or pretzels? No, no thank, thank you, you Mrs. Lerman. Lerman. 
and monologues about his evil plan to crash the internet for good, with a simple barcode for a can of sausage. Don't ask how that works, I don't get it myself. After Luker's doomsday can of sausages is let out into the wild, Ron grabs any can he can see, and Kim takes down Luker himself. The day is saved and the prices at Smarty Mart are still mind-boggling. In the episode 2 to Tudor, we see a villain team-up I never would have thought of. Senior Senior Junior teams up with Shigo as he's in desperate need of a tutor to improve his villainy. Junior eventually gets pretty good at robberies, but his father gets a bit jealous now that his son is better than him at being a villain. Kim and Ron are alerted of Junior and Shigo's next target by Senior, who fails at leaving an anonymous tip in pretty spectacular fashion. Two thieves will be attempting to steal your chocolate chip recipe. Father, what are you doing in the dark? Junior, no, the lights. Kim and Ron stake out to protect the chocolate chip recipe. Really, of all the things to steal, why did they choose that? Regardless, Junior and Shigo are caught. This is a very strange secret recipe. What? You are so busted. Shouldn't there be some mention of flour or eggs? Let me see that. The evil duo is stopped and sent to jail, and the uh, chocolate chip recipe is saved. In another later episode titled Job Unfair, Dr. Draken returns, this time stealing a giant weather machine. Don't know how those are made, but whatever. Draken takes the thing for a test drive and sucks up an entire lake to convert into a storm later, all in hopes to take over Canada of all places. I mean, hey, it's nice up there, I can't blame him. Why Canada anyway? High literacy rate, good health care, and sparkling clean cities. Since when do you care? All of which will be my evil kingdom. Draken and Shigo are still getting a hang of the machine though, thank goodness. Ron and Kim go to investigate the dealership where Draken stole the weather machine and arrive just in time to hear the place being broken into again. Kim is taken down by Shigo, who's stealing the owner's manual, and Ron lets her get away. Because of course he does. I got her, KP! At one of their favorite restaurants, Bueno Nacho, Kim and Ron are shown what Draken's doing to Canada's Great Lakes and instantly get on the case, heading to the last lake he hasn't hit yet. The two are caught and tied to a lightning rod just as Draken starts up a storm. Kim gets on top of the machine, fights Shigo. Ron stops Draken and makes up for his earlier blunder, and the machine is turned off before the storm gets too crazy. Also, eagle-eyed viewers will notice that the weather machine from the last episode is also present in the episode Day of the Snowmen, where a surprise blizzard strikes Kim's hometown of Middleton. Mutant snowmen start to attack, but thankfully Kim puts them away, melting them and then using the weather machine to drop all the toxic snowman sludge into Camp Wanaweep, the same camp Ron went to as a child. Another little easter egg there, pretty neat if I do say so myself. Next up, we've got the first Kim Possible movie, titled A Sitch in Time. And well, it's a time travel story, so prepare yourself for an extra complicated story here. To start off, Ron's moving. Yeah, not good. To make things worse, Ron's moving all the way to Norway. So the question is, how will he help Kim with crime fighting now? Ron officially leaves town, and all hope seems lost. You miss him a lot, huh? We've been tight for so long. How can you miss him? He calls every five minutes. <laughs> right on schedule. How's the flight, Ron? Nine hours to Norway. Ow! Kim's alerted of a robbery by Wade and heads over, with Ron promising to be there and keep up his crime-fighting tendencies with Kim. Kim arrives to find Monkey Fist trying to steal some artifacts at a museum. She takes him down, but doesn't realize he's being aided by Duff Killigan, Shigo, and Draken all at the same time. The slew of villains take the monkey artifact and leave with Kim trapped in a sarcophagus. Ron shows up about 12 hours late. The museum curator tells the duo that the monkey artifact was only half of a full monkey idol, and if the two pieces are put together, evil could be unleashed. Meanwhile, Kim decides to try out another partner to take Ron's role while he's gone, turning to her friend Monique, but things don't quite work out. The villains get their hands on the other half of the idol and return to a monkey temple to fuse the parts and unleash the power, where Kim arrives just before the ritual begins. Unfortunately, Monkey Fist puts the pieces together, and the villains step through a time portal, as hinted at by Draken, because, you know, he loves to explain evil plans. So long, Kim Possible. We'll meet again in time. 
A few days later, after losing their last battle, Kim is approached by Rufus's descendant from the future, Rufus 3000. She's shown an alternate future, where it looks like Dr. Dragon has taken over the world, leading to Rufus 3000 having to come around and try to set things straight for Kim, giving her a time-traveling watch. Oh, and apparently, Draken, or whoever has taken over in the future, is known as the Supreme One. Meanwhile, the villains are shown to have come up with their plan, go undercover as toddlers to stop Kim from crime fighting, all the way back on her first day of preschool. Meanwhile, present-day Ron is going through a book of memories, and we get a little reference back to when he first became a school mascot as an easter egg for eagle-eyed fans. But when he gets to the page of him and Kim back in pre-K on the day they met, the picture seems to change to show the kid versions of the villains in their class. Shigo, still normal-aged, is on the lookout, but Kim travels in time to find her, leading to a fight. While that's happening, little Kim is getting bullied by the mini-villains, causing a preschool Ron to stand up for her and enact justice. The jungle law of daycare is behind us. We have structure. We have rules. Get him! Ah leading to him getting bullied as well. Oh, and also Ron's imaginary friend is a giant imaginary friend named Rufus. That's adorable, honestly. Little Kim whoops the preschooler bad guys and Big Kim beats Shigo, causing the villains to retreat back into their time portal. They head off to the day KimPossible.com went online, the site where people submit their emergencies to Kim in order to try and ruin Kim's first mission and crush her spirit. Although, as a backup, Monkey Fist goes back in time to get some ancient gorilla power so they can crush more than Kim's spirit. Young Kim and young Ron go to their first job, saving a billionaire from his own security laser system, with the villains lurking behind them. Oh, and we get to see baby Rufus. Look at this cute, disgusting little guy. P.S. The reason the billionaire contacted Kim was actually just due to a typo. He was really trying to get to the website of Team Impossible. I got it. Team Impossible. Who? Team Impossible Super Secret Commando Squad. This is what they train for. This seems minute, but just trust me, you should remember it. Young Kim saves the billionaire by dodging the lasers and turning off the machine, and completes her first missions with no snags. Until Monkey Fist returns with a giant stone gorilla robot thing. Oh, and young Ron gets afraid because it's a monkey. Of course. Modern day Kim shows up to help young Kim take down the robot monkey gorilla thing. But while that's happening, a version of Shigo from the future pulls present-day Shigo aside and tells her to grab the time monkey when all hope seems lost. This can end well. Rufus 3000 brings modern Ron back in time to join the fray as well, and he inadvertently saves the day. So, seems the day is saved, right? Kim and Ron give their young selves some advice for the future, with Ron even referencing when he got his hair cut. Another good callback. Okay, look, listen to me. In the future, you will change your hair and become a babe magnet. Keep that look! Okay, but what about the hat? Forget the hat! The villains are arrested, but Shigo managed to slip away and grab the time monkey, meaning Kim's job isn't quite done just yet. Shigo escapes through a time portal, and Rufus 3000 returns, telling Kim that the Supreme One still took over. Kim gets confused as Draken is still in custody, but Rufus reveals it's really Shigo who took over in the future. Ron and Kim decide they've got to take the fight to her in the future, and so they hop through a portal to chase after her. After disguising themselves, the Kim and Ron are caught by Shigo's drones and sent to the Attitude Adjustment Center, which in reality is just their high school. To make things worse, it seems Kim's old high school rival, Bonnie Rockwaller, is a teacher there, and she's totally heartless. Bonnie plays an instructional video as well, showing Shigo has even usurped Dr. Draken, turning him into the sidekick. Eyes on me. You know, I started out as an underestimated sidekick, trying to make the stupid schemes of others succeed. My schemes were not stupid. Ah, Two freedom fighters show up to bust Kim and Ron out with the help of a naked Morad army. The fighters are revealed to be future versions of Kim's little brothers, who also explain that their parents lead a migration to the moon when Shigo took over. And I mean, hey, they seem to be doing alright, which is good. Kim and Ron are brought to the Resistance base and meet Wade in person for the first time, albeit it's a future version of him who's ripped, but still, they met him. Kim and the crew sneak into Shigo's lair to try and steal the Time Monkey and end all the madness. 
but run into future versions of the villains before they get there. They get past Monkey Paws and his monkey army, and a now cybernetic Duff Killigan, reaching Shigo in her throne room. However, Shigo orders a now buff Draken to fight Kim and Ron, and the battle begins. Even with the aid of future Monique, remember from earlier in the movie, the resistance is beaten. But Draken convinces Shigo to give in to his supervillain habit of explaining her evil plan. Hey, is. Huh? Hey! Ah! No touching my monkey! Can't blame a guy for trying! Where she reveals she was also responsible for Ron moving to Norway. That gives Ron the aggressive fuel to easily take down Draken, blow up the fortress, and accidentally destroy the time monkey, which, of course, sets everything back to normal. Oh, and Shigo gets kicked off of a cliff in brutal fashion. Good lord. In a later episode titled Motor Ed, we're introduced to a character named, well, Motor Ed. Kim is called by Wade, telling her there's been a string of robberies involving super powerful engines and motors. But before she heads to action, she meets a son of one of her parents' work friends named Felix, who is wheelchair bound. Kim tries to come up with something all three of them can do, and decides to head to a monster truck rally, where it seems Motor Ed has picked his next robbery target. Kim catches up to him while he's escaping, but ultimately doesn't quite stop him. Wade gives Kim more info on her new foe, where she learns Motor Ed was fired from a mechanical engineering job because, and I'm not making this up, they asked him to cut off his mullet. Well, do I look foul! You don't clip the lion's mane while he roars. Seriously. What is it with people and hair in this show? Kim, Ron, and Felix set up a fake super engine that's made by her dad's company that'll attract Motor Ed as a trap, and he falls right for it. Ed actually beats Kim and the gang in their fight, though, and takes off with the fake motor. And Kim knows that he's not gonna be happy when he figures out it's fake. After Ed kidnaps Ron, Kim and Felix go off to rescue him. But as they escape, they're cornered by Ed and his gang in monster trucks. They beat Ed with some help from Felix's robotic wheelchair. And again, the world is saved. Motor Ed is such a weird guy, though. Oh, he's also canonically Draken's cousin, so that's even weirder. In the episode Dimension Twist, a top secret lab is broken into and has had their pan dimensional vortex inducer stolen. If you remember back to season 1, episode The New Ron, you'll know that last time it was Dr. Draken who wanted the device, and so no doubt, he couldn't be far behind this time. Unsurprisingly, we cut to Draken, who set up a laser cannon thanks to his newly stolen pan dimensional vortex inducer, and he's getting his cable box hooked up to his TV. He rushes the man who's setting up his cable, though, and accidentally switches the wires for the laser and the cable, which, hey, that can only go over well. Yeah, believe me, Doc, you scare me just the way you are. Are you being sweet or sarcastic? I never can tell. Kim shows up, Draken tries to fire the cannon, and they all get sucked into the TV. Throughout the rest of the episode, everyone goes channel hopping and deals with the consequences of where they land. Sure enough, the episode ends with Kim and Ron escaping the television and Draken and Shigo continuing to flick through channels. Honestly though, who else is getting major Fairly Odd Parents channel chaser vibes? Okay, in the next episode, we get payoff for something I told you guys to remember a while back. Remember during the movie where I said you guys should take note that the billionaire who Kim saved in her first mission was originally trying to contact Team Impossible? Well, they finally show up in the episode that's fittingly titled Team Impossible, telling Kim her days as a hero are over. Seeing as they charge to save lives, Team Impossible explains to her that the little typo the billionaire made ended up causing them to lose a lot of money in the long run. They tell Kim to call off the life-saving immediately and then blast through the ceiling. Sheesh, kinda jerky. The rival team ends up cutting Kim off from all her transport she uses to save the world. Since you were last minute additions to our group, we don't have a boxed lunch for you two. Oh, that's, that's fine. Hold on, Kim. We had to pay for this ride with our own money. We're entitled to this lunch. It's fine, Ron. And when Wade tries to access their data by hacking, they counter hack and blow his computer fuses. Luckily, Wade did get their location before they ruined his system and reads it to Kim over the phone with a tear in his eye. Kim and Ron fall into Team Impossible's secret lair 
And to even the numbers game, a super ticked off Wade bursts into the scene and sets off the Lair's laser defense system, the same one that Millionaire had back in the movie. Also, yeah, Wade finally showed up in person for real this time. I mean, his buff self was cool and all, but present day Wade? Now that guy is just a whole different beast entirely. Kim saves the team to put them in their place. And the episode ends with them all getting tacos at Ron's favorite place, Bueno Nacho. Yum. Oh, also, little easter egg here. Team Impossible's costumes are super heavily inspired from old X-Men costumes, specifically the blue and gold team. That one's for you comic nerds out there. Ladies and gents, it's time for the second Kim Possible movie titled So the Drama. Get excited, cause this one's juicy. Draken is starting his first real attempt at taking over the world, first having Shigo kidnap the same Japanese toy company president from the very first episode of the show. Thankfully, Kim saves the president, but Shigo manages to flee the scene before they can catch her. Draken officially tells Shigo he's upping his game back at his base, and shows that he's trying to get more into Kim's head as well by learning the ways of a teenage girl. I will get inside her high school head. I will know Kim Possible's fatal flaw. Demons! Progress report! What up, Dr. D. Diggity Dog? We've lost Demons. As well as that, he also finds a doodle from the Japanese toy maker he managed to snag from his goat during the abduction attempt, saying it's the first step in his quest for world domination. Uh, Kim heads over to the Bermuda Triangle, where Draken has been spotted, and sneaks in via disguise while Draken is talking to some mobster dude for information. Shigo finds Kim and a fight ensues, while it's revealed Draken is looking for the secret to Cybertronics, which is known only by one man. Dr. Possible. Draken and Shigo escape, leaving Kim and Ron in the dust. Uh oh. A few days removed from the incident at the Bermuda Triangle, Kim is shown back at high school. A little sad that everyone is paired up for the prom except for her. She usually takes Ron as a friend, but this year, she wants to try and change that. Ron meets a new friend named Eric and shows him around the school. Eric sees Kim and asks Ron about her, as it seems he's taken a romantic interest in her, even asking if Ron and her had ever dated. No, 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 we've been best friends since, you know, forever, but not like that. You know, she's a... Ah, extreme steam. Okay, hey, you know what? Let's not talk about her that way ever again, okay? Okay. Whatever's clever. Kim meets Eric and instantly becomes lovestruck, with the two having a lovey montage together. Without poor Ron, Dr. Possible is later shown in his lab, perfecting a cybernetic project called Hephaestus, and Dr. Draken sneaks in saying he wants it. Dr. Possible deletes the project files right in front of Draken, and stupidly says it doesn't matter to him because he's memorized it. So Draken decides to try out his new brain-tapping machine on Dr. Possible. So Dr. Possible is a rocket scientist, but he makes blunders like that. Ooh boy. Kim finds out about the kidnapping and takes Ron with her to Draken's lair, where they're quickly found and forced to have a tied up Dr. Possible. Draken also says he's located in a new base and is merely a hologram there, so that's always fun. Kim saves her dad and asks what happened, but he mysteriously can't remember anything from that night. Hmm. It's then shown that Bueno Nachos around the world, remember Ron's favorite taco place, are starting to have toys come with their meals that look just like the stolen toy concept Draken had. Uh oh. Kim talks to Ron about Eric, who Ron is clearly a bit jealous of for taking all of Kim's time away from him. Kim assures their dynamic won't change, just as Eric shows up outside to go on a walk with him, where after he asks about her missions, he asks her to go to prom. Ron admits to Rufus that he's recently started thinking there could be something there between him and Kim, but worries now that if he comes clean about his feelings to Kim, it could ruin her night with Eric. Or worse, their friendship. Yeesh, what a love triangle he's gotten tangled in. Inevitably, Eric takes Kim off to the prom, and they have a blast, while Ron goes off to Buenos Nachos all alone. However, the cashier there says that something evil is up, even spelling it out with hot sauce while his boss isn't looking. When Ron realizes the bendy straws have been replaced by normal straws, he gets outraged and has Wade get him a call with the head of Bueno Nacho, who's revealed to be Draken. This is no bueno. The toys served at Buenos Nacho begin mobilizing, causing Ron to rush over to Kim at prom and get her on the case. My best friend Kim will believe me, right Kim? Oh, I, uh... Totally believe you. The toys were here. And they were evil! Um, right. Eric isn't pleased. Elsewhere, Draken is talking with Shigo about activating the robots worldwide at midnight, but having Middleton, Kim's hometown, activated immediately. Oh, and he's a framed picture of Eric and Kim on his desk. What? And the robots are made with the technology Draken stole from Dr. Possible, which he also says can grow, repair, and modify itself. 
Draken activates the robots, causing Kim and Ron to flee from their home, as they're just way too big and dangerous to handle. Kim and Ron knock over the Bueno Nacho sign, turning off the signal that controls all the robots, and Middleton is saved. Except it's not. Draken calls Kim and shows he's kidnapped Eric, and says she'll need to surrender to free him. Kim and Ron head over to Bueno Nacho headquarters, Draken's new lair, with Kim decked out in a new battle suit and with a new laser gun. Shigo and Kim fight, and thanks to her new suit, Kim is able to put Shigo away relatively quickly. Eric shows up to congratulate Kim, but reveals he's actually a robot synthodrone of Draken's. Yikes, that's not fun. Oh, and if that isn't bad enough for you, Shigo wakes back up and takes both Kim and Ron out, tying them up downstairs. The two slowly wake up, and Kim starts to regret her interest in Eric. Oh, you kissed a synthodrone! I never kissed him, but I wanted to. Okay, too much info. Causing Ron to admit that he actually likes her himself. Ooh. You really think there's a guy out there for me? Out there? In here? Oh, really? Sure, you know, guys like Hi. Rufus? Rufus. Before the conversation gets further though, Rufus helps them escape to go get revenge on Draken. Draken launches the robots worldwide, just as Kim and Ron make it upstairs to stop them. Shigo takes on Kim, and Ron takes on Eric, knocking his head all the way around. Yeesh, gross. Thanks to some help from Rufus biting Eric and draining him of his goop, don't question it, the control tower is blown up, and Ron goes over to Draken, telling him he took things too far by ruining Bueno Nacho. He even accidentally quotes Heisenberg from Breaking Bad. Oh, I beg of you! Say my name. Say it! Uh. Three years before Breaking Bad even came out. I don't know, I just thought that was kind of funny. The villains are sent to jail, and Kim takes Ron to the dance, where they finally kiss. Well, I mean, it's kind of been a long time coming. But that's not all Kim Possible had in store for us. We've got a couple more to cover that serve as a great ending to the series. So without further ado, let's hop to it. Before that part where you melted, we, we were at the dance and we kissed. Yeah. Did you have the same dream? No, that part really happened, Ron. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it won't happen again if you keep calling me in the middle of the night. In the first episode of the new season, now that Ron and Kim are dating, Ron gets worried that Kim will dump her considering all the other cheerleaders date jocks, and so he becomes a football player, with a little help from Kim's battle suit. Dementor also returns, trying to steal the suit, and he actually succeeds. But Kim rewires the suit to go against his wishes, so that doesn't work out too well for him. At least Ron is still on the football team, I guess, being an even better runner than passer, even without the suit. In the episode Mad Dogs and Aliens, Ron's football career catches up to him and causes him to have to give his mascot job to Kim's little brothers. Meanwhile, we cut to Draken in prison, playing checkers with Frugal Luker, before some green light breaks Draken out, who's presumably Shigo considering she broke out with Motorhead in the previous episode titled Car Alarm. Kim hears of Draken's escape and tracks down Shigo, but she says she had nothing to do with it. That'll be all, Midas. Do you know how hard it is to get an appointment with him? Meanwhile, Draken is shown to be on a ship with an alien named War Manga, who's looking for the Great Blue, some being who her species is destined to meet. And well, Draken's got blue skin, so… Draken decides to lie and say he is the Great Blue, when he realizes that she'd give all her weapons to him and have him lead the alien race through intergalactic conquest though, which, yeah. Definitely seems up Draken's alley. After kidnapping Shigo as revenge for not breaking him out earlier, Draken tells Kim of a device he and Warmanga made to drain the Earth of all its oxygen. Kim shows up and meets Warmanga, and then destroys the device in Draken's new base. Basic Kim stuff, you know? In the series finale, Kim is finally graduating from high school, but Ron is worried the relationship will end when they go off to college. KP, why does it have to end? <laughs> Uh, I guess I sort of freaked. <laughs> Felix shows up again and is actually the valedictorian of the class, just as everyone is let out on their last day of school. And all seems to be well, with Kim reassuring Ron it's not the end of the world. However, it may just be the end of the world, as when Kim leaves to head out with her family for the graduation ceremony, a giant alien spaceship strikes her house. Uh-oh. While giving a speech at graduation, Kim is abducted by an alien spaceship, leaving Ron on the ground. Turns out, Draken was abducted too. Well, 
well, well. Even captivity can have an upside to see Kim Possible helpless. And War Manga alongside her battle mate, Warhawk, who looks kinda like Drax the Destroyer with those tattoos, I've gotta say, have plans to get revenge on him and Kim by taking over the world. It really is the end of the world after all. The aliens send giant ship things toward every part of the world to take over, with Kim and Ron still stuck on the ship. Also, Draken has flower petals growing from him thanks to a failed experiment. If I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. Don't question it. Ron and Dr. Possible decide to head off and build a rocket to reach Kim, while Kim and Draken break free from the spaceship's jail thanks to a mutant flower that grows from Draken's neck. Don't question. Eh, you get it already. With help from Shigo, of all people, Ron and Dr. Possible set up a rocket, but Shigo forces Dr. Possible to stand guard at the space station while she and Ron head into space. Ron and Shigo sneak on board and meet up with Kim and Draken, and to probably everyone's surprise, Jacken and Shigo almost hug each other. Maybe they aren't so evil after all. Rufus finds the off switch to the ship, causing it to start to plummet to the earth. The team begin their escape, and Draken actually has a plan to save the world, not take it over. He really might be changing. My greatest plan ever! To save the world? Do not make me say those words! The team reaches Earth thanks to escape pods, but are still on the run from the aliens, and are still following Draken's supposed plan. Draken and Shigo head to grab the invention that made Draken start sprouting petals, while Kim and Ron distract the rest of the alien army. As they seem cornered, Draken stops the alien's robot warships by commanding his flowers to attack, taking them down super easily. The aliens are caught, and it seems like things are about to go back to normal, before they break free and capture Kim. Ron, channeling his monkey kung fu powers he got from season 1, decimates the aliens and hurls them right towards their crashing ship, making them blow up, I guess, I don't know. Kim and Ron finally graduate. Draken receives a Medal of Honor and is forced to hug Shigo by his neck flower. And the show ends with Ron and Kim riding off into the stars with one final kiss. What a happy ending. But there is one last very, very, very important thing that I missed through all of this. I'm going to tell it to you right now. You ready? Three. Two, one. <gasps> Kim met Lilo and Stitch. No explanation needed. Have a good one, everybody.